Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is Guy Talk Day, or Guys Who Talk, and boy, do I love this time together because there's such great fellowship and camaraderie, and I hope you can find environments like this where um, you can gather with like-minded people and talk about God's Word and talk about what's going on in your lives, and it is such a, a great time for me to be around this table with these brothers in Christ. I've got uh, a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher. I've got uh, Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. here for Guy Talk. So all you uh, out there who have questions and you've had thoughts and you're wondering uh, about something in Scripture or something that's going on in your church— you can always send them over to me at 877-933-2484. We do our best to collect all the questions that come in and get to them when we can. But today, I want to start by just uh, welcoming the team and saying, are you guys ready to go today? Oh, yes, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to go. Ready, ready to go. You all look ready, so that's good. All right, here's my first question. Uh, we learn in Scripture that Jesus was tempted in every way. So when you feel tempted, what do you do when it comes to prayer and repentance? Now, we don't have to repent of temptations, right? Just repent of sin. Jesus didn't sin, so he had no sins to repent. But he suffered temptations. When you suffer temptations, how do you process that? For me, it's two ways. One is to compartmentalize the temptation and to move on, try to shove it down into a barrel and put the lid on it and nice. bury it. And the other is what we've talked about on the show in the past is threshold thinking. I, I guess I, I've, been, I've read so much of Neil Anderson's work. So when he talked about threshold thinking, what he is saying is, is that as soon as you are tempted, you're at the threshold. It'll be too late if you cross over the threshold because then it's a series of decisions you're going to be making leading to potentially sin. So you have to stop it at the threshold. So that's what I what I try to do. I like it. I like uh, God's promise, too. In 1 Corinthians mm-hmm. chapter 10, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So I like to look for the way out. God says he's provided me a way out, promised that I won't be tempted beyond which I can bear. And so the temptation that comes before me is something that God says, you're able to handle this. I provided you a way out. Take it. Now, I think you're exactly right when you cross that threshold, Greg, as you were talking about, that's when you ignore that way out. Right. You ignore God's voice. You, you ignore the door sitting over in the corner of the room saying, hey, that's your way out here. And you, you decide, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to enter into this temptation, whatever it is. Um, so look for God's way out. If you give your desires full vent, it's like running downhill where the momentum overtakes you and there's no way that you can turn back once you pass that that point good and, picture and so the idea is crossing over the threshold what you're entering is that slippery slope i believe the biggest enemy in all of our life is ourself we have a tendency to deceive ourselves to lie to ourselves to justify so one of the things i've learned to do and i do this often i i ask literally in prayer almost every day to some degree jesus make me aware of what's really going on inside of me and then the second thing is I believe the Word of God that says there's power in the name of Jesus. So when the temptation comes up, I usually verbally will actually say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. Jesus, help me. I want to do your will. And I'd like to say I'm perfect in that. I'm not. I've made mistakes along the way, but I keep learning 
the more I call on the name of Jesus and the more I recognize it for what it is, the more power I have to overcome it. Have you ever felt really the presence of the enemy, like a heavy cloud, or when you walk into a certain home or even in your own home potentially, and feeling that? Absolutely, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, one of my grandsons called me the other day and, and uh, was kind of distraught and was concerned because he just felt like he was burdened. I said, how long ago was it when you bought your house? And he told me, and I said, son, what you need to do is you need to go to every single room, including the bathrooms, and claim them for Christ and say it out loud in every room that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Satan, yes. leave my home. And so he did that. And when I, he came back for, for prenatal counseling with me, he and his fiance, I said, well, how did it go? He says, Papa, it was unreal. He said, just felt like things cleared. There was, mm. And I said, well, you, you, you went into a home that was already purchased by somebody in the past, and it could have been there uh, during that time. And I, I'm a full believer of that, that, that. And that's what Debbie and I did when we bought our home. We prayed through every single Smart. room. Mm. Smart. You know, it's interesting. Because I've got a similar story. I'm at a church in North Minneapolis, and I had a young adult woman and her mother come to me and say, since I moved to my apartment, you know, and I'm paying a big price for it, I have strange thoughts. I feel a presence. I don't know what to do about it. And so they asked me to come over and pray. So I went over there and, and prayed with them. And for whatever reason, I don't know how the Lord did this, but he prompted me to go into the bathroom and to remove the mirror. There was a pentagram under the mirror. Oh, my and it word. it was detailed on all kind of witch stuff or satanic stuff. And all of a sudden, it just hit all of us that something had gone on here that shouldn't have gone on. Mm-hmm. And uh, we called the management that day. They came out and removed that part of the wall. They didn't just paint over it. They removed that part of the wall oh, wow. and literally put a new wall in. And from that moment on, she got relief. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. Thank you for that, Tom Parrish. All right, um, let, uh, let's go to the next question here. Uh, since making disciples is the command of Jesus in Matthew 28, go and make disciples, what kind of practical steps can the local church take to make sure a new believer is discipled as soon as possible? Well, you, you can disciple as soon as possible. <laughs> this is the kind of genius we get from the Sunday school genius. teacher. I know, that's right. No, it's it's you have to be purposeful in the church. Making disciples is a proactive, uh, you know, exercise. A disciple, by the way, is simply in the Greek a learner, someone who learns. It's like uh, apprenticeship. I think we all understand if you had a an electrical apprenticeship or a plumbing apprenticeship, you are going to spend time with someone who knows that skill. Um, that industry, whatever, and you're going to learn it. And over time, you're going to grow in your knowledge of that until you become someone who then can disciple others. It's the same thing in Christianity. A new believer in Christ needs to be discipled. They need to be trained on this whole, you know, how does God want us to live? How now shall we live? And so in Acts, early in Acts, it says that the early church devoted themselves to what? to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and prayer. Hey, that's four things that I think our churches should be pretty dedicated to. And what's first on that list? The apostles' teachings. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if you, this has been your experience, but uh, the longer I've lived in faith and been involved in churches in the Western culture, I'm finding fewer and fewer churches who see that as a number one priority. It's always relegated to the, if you really want to get into the Word, meet with this group that's meeting down in the kitchen on Saturday mornings. (laughs) Uh, But the idea is that discipleship is a process, as you pointed out. And I just finished with 25 guys over a period of 20-some weeks, taking them through the fundamentals of the faith. And they stuck with me during all that time. And at the end of it, many of them said they had never been taught these things. Yeah. And all I was hoping to do is be a conduit for the Lord to build a foundation, a solid foundation they could stand on. So no matter what winds or torrents hit them, they'd be able to stand their ground. And so I think we need to raise the priority of discipleship. But some churches say, well, we're a discipleship church. 
the first question I want to ask them is, a disciple to do what? What are you discipling them for? Just telling me that you're all about discipleship, what's the objective? And so once you determine the objective, which is Christ-likeness, then everything builds towards that. The passage that you were referring to about making disciples is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When you look at this in Greek, the only imperative... The only command in there is to make disciples. Yep. So a colloquial way of saying this is, as you're going during the normal course of the activities of your life, make disciples. And how do you do that? And it tells you right here in this passage, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We have worked very hard, and it would taken me a long time to figure this out, Greg, but you pastored, I pastored. I still do. You know what it's like in the local church. Somebody comes to Jesus at an altar call or in your office or with somebody else. And then we usually say, yeah, we've got a Bible study on Saturday. Maybe you ought to go to it. Or we're not even starting a new members class until September. So, you know, I hope you're there. And we know that we don't do well with those situations. People get drift away. The devil comes to work. What we're trying to do now is simply this. Somebody comes to me or I pray with somebody to receive Jesus. The first thing I do, let's say it's a woman who has come to me uh, or even a husband and wife. First thing I do is tell them, I'm going to have two people from our church call you today Hmm. who literally have been trained to disciple. Now, they're understanding a discipleship. And and by the way, Greg, I want your 25 things that you did on discipleship because I've got my own, but I want to see it. What's interesting about it is that they not only call that person, they immediately invite, invite them out to coffee, like to Perkins or whatever. And they begin a process where they're in contact with them at least twice a week from that point on, either over the phone or in person, looking at the Word, praying together, hearing what these people have to say. What we're finding is we're retaining those people so that when the the class comes along that's more in-depth, they're ready to step into that class where the interim in between is where we're losing them. So we're trying to make it much more personal and I like what I'm seeing. That, that actually correlates with what you said on the show um, more than once, that it's one thing to receive Jesus as Savior. It's another thing to embrace him as Lord. Yeah. So it's not just about what accrues to your account at the moment of salvation. Right. It's your obligations and responsibilities now that you're a part of the family of God. There has to be some follow-up with them, not just getting them in the door, but show them how to navigate the rooms. So if, if the church is not, we've made a strong case here that discipleship is this process of learning, of teaching, the apostles' teaching, of uh, um, um, commanding them to obey all that I've taught to you, as the, as the passage from Matthew says. Um, and we've made a strong case for that. It's, it's teaching people's God's ways, the, the Word of God. If churches aren't doing that, what are they doing? If we're yeah. not teaching doctrine, you know, Paul exhorts Timothy in First Timothy to watch your life and your doctrine closely, persevere in them, he says. Um, so Paul makes a big deal about the doctrinal truths of the Word of God. If they're not doing that, what are they doing? And I would argue that what has replaced doctrinal understanding and discipleship in the Word of God is in a kind of an emotional-based Christianity— where we're we're trying to set up an experience within the church using many different techniques uh, where you feel closer to God in some kind of experiential way instead of teaching the Word of God to the church. Because I have all my aha moments and experiential moments with God primarily in the Word of God when I'm studying the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You are listening to Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. Let's get all the... Legal mumbo-jumbo out of the way. This is Afternoons with Bill Arnold, and it's brought to you in part by the middle portion of the day called Afternoons. Some refer to the middle portion as nap time. Side effects may include clarity, new biblical insight, and a greater love for Jesus. Reproduction of this broadcast is free, and you can do it today without express written permission of Major League Baseball. We're going to take a break and be right back. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. And I'm thinking of a particular couple from northern Minnesota. 
Or you might be more like the person that just goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. Well, the good news is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word APP to 877-933-2484 and then click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a coffee shop, but you should see the prices of biscotti. They have gone through the roof. I recommend avoiding it. All right, welcome back to Guy Talker, guys who talk. I have Greg B, Tom P, Jeff B. It's going to be an awesome discussion today. I've got a question about a family member who is apparently experiencing all kinds of problems. They recently called and said, I know you're like religious, but this (sighs) Jesus stuff is more than I can take. And I want to, but I want you to pray for me and give me any kind of help with my troubled life. How should I respond? Well, Jesus is a lot of help for that troubled life. Yeah. You know, Jesus said, all who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. Um, If you know the Lord, um, you have peace with God, which is being reconciled to God. But as you trust in him as as a believer, you have the peace of God. And that peace of God transcends all understanding as Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says. So as we trust in him... Christians just have so much more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and what's the rest of them? You know, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Um, and and the world is in in turmoil. They have angst. They don't have the peace. They worry about everything and so on. So, you know, in the end, you have to point someone to Jesus Christ and the peace that he has. Um, look. We can't do anything about tomorrow. We can't, most of the time, we are powerless to change our circumstances. The only thing that we have power to do is how we react to our circumstances. And so instead of worrying about tomorrow, I think God says over and over again, trust in me because I'm the one who holds tomorrow in my hands. I I have to, this is full disclosure here. I have little patience with people who are unwilling to do what it takes to feed themselves, to grow, to develop a discipline of study, and because, oh, it's just too hard, that Jesus stuff. And so they want to live vicariously through somebody else, and so they'll ask that somebody else, well, will you pray for me? The first thing I want to say is, well, doing it on your own terms like you've just suggested, how's that going for you? And secondly, what's wrong with you praying for yourself? Now, I know that doesn't sound like I'm being very patient, and I'm probably not. But sooner or later, people have to take responsibility for their growth. Who's responsible for spiritual growth? The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us and empowers us, but he works in tandem with us as we act in obedience to what God's telling us. One of the things I've learned about Satan he loves cliches, and I hear more people with cliches about this Jesus stuff. <clears throat> in the beginning, I would have confronted them pretty heavily, and you know my ministry. And over the years, what I've learned to do is I've learned to say, you know, yeah, I'm I'm glad to pray for you, but can you explain to me what this Jesus stuff is? Hmm. And I'll get silent, and I'll just let them talk. And usually, they don't really know what they're talking about, or they don't know what to say. And and so I simply say to them, you know. It sounds to me like you're missing a whole big chunk of what the Bible's about. Mm -hmm. Would you like to learn more about that that I think would help you with your problem? And that's usually when I get them into John or the the seven claims of Jesus and John or work through it with them. I've seen people come out of this. But if they won't do that, Craig, you're absolutely right. If I can't get them or the Holy Spirit can't get them to want to learn, but I want them to learn through the doorway that they open. Explain to me what you mean by this Jesus stuff, and I just let them talk. And usually, you know, it's stuff I've heard before, and it's all pretty shallow. And then I challenge them, would you really like to know? Because that's not the Jesus I know. You know, Jesus says, who by worrying can add even a single hour to your life? Why do you worry, he says, what you should eat, what you should wear? Isn't, aren't human beings more important than the birds that he feeds and the grass of the field that he clothes, right? So God's given us the picture— Trust in me. 
Just trust in me, right? I know tomorrow. I hold it in the hand, in my hands. Who, by worrying, can add even one hour to their life? So God gives this picture over and over in Scripture. Don't worry about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Cast your cares upon the Lord. As a believer in Christ, if we understand, this gets to our knowledge of God and his word again, if we understand his promises, what he has actually promised to those who believe, they're pretty amazing once you study them and once you understand them. One is that we have an inheritance that cannot perish or spoiled or fade, kept in heaven for us. He's given us eternal life. We are going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And as we experience trouble, persecution in this world, he even says our light and momentary troubles are nothing compared to this eternal greatness that he has in store for us. You know, a mentor of mine had this wonderful term called smorgasbord Christianity. And what he meant by that is that we are in a habit, a lot, a lot of times in Western culture, to go along the line and pick what we want and leave the rest. When my parents used to take us as children to the smorgasbord, I'd head for two places on that big, long table. <laughs> One was strawberries, and the other was shrimp. <laughs> and that's all I would eat. I'd eat my weight in those, both of those. But that's the, how we approach our faith because it accommodates a lifestyle that we're used to. We'd like to be removed from that bondage, but we're unwilling to go ahead and do it ourselves along with the Holy Spirit. So we go along the line and pick what we want and leave the rest. We're smorgasbord Christians. Mm. You know, one of the great promises mm. of Scripture, but one of the hardest promises to really accept is that God is working all things for good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a huge promise. And yet, if that's true, then then why do we worry about anything? Um, if he's really working all things, and all really means all, and good really means good, then we should just simply trust him. The and biggest what? problem people have, even Christians, with that statement, is they keep getting in Jesus' way. If we would just simply submit and listen to him, But too often, here's the problem. When I get in trouble, my first inclination is to tell Jesus what I want him to do. Well, that's not the way to do it. My first inclination ought to be, Jesus, what do you want to do? And how do I get back on track with you? And, guys, when I do that, it doesn't happen necessarily overnight, but the Lord begins to open doors or opportunities that take me in a different direction. My dad used to um, work with rocks. He'd, He'd go along the beach and pick up these rocks, these agates, and then he put him into this big machine that had other things in there besides sand. To, the tumbler. The tumbler. To, yeah. To polish, polish the rocks. To polish them up. And that was always, as I looked and reflected back on that, it was a, a, a lesson for me that spiritual growth doesn't happen without some friction in your life. Yeah. That the polish of the spirit in your life is going to come through the frictions that we're faced with and that we don't ignore but that we experience. I got the title for your next book, Greg. What's that? Rock Tumbler Christian Theology. (laughs) It would be good. Well, the passage in Proverbs that says, as iron sharpens iron, Mm, one man another, I think of two uh, bars of iron coming together and what would happen is a big spray of sparks. Yeah. And so you have to realize that when you you have that encounter, there's going to be sparks. Yeah. You know, Romans, Paul says in Romans pretty much the same thing. He says, not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Yeah, I we think, don't have to look for that suffering. No, it's no, out it, there it's, in this world, it's, right? It's coming. And so we're being tumbled. I love the name of that, but somebody's got to have written a book like that already. No? Uh, yeah, I think it would be great. Rock Tumbler, you know, Christian Rock, theology. Yeah. We, we should get it out there. <laughs> We go through life, we do have trouble, but it will polish you, it will sharpen you. Yep. All right, in the next five minutes, gentlemen, let's, uh, before we go to break, let's do a little refresher on salvation. And I want to talk about the ABCs of salvation. So, and I want you to fill in and jump in anytime you want. Uh, A is just admit you're a sinner and you need a Savior. Don't we have the need for need? And that's one of the big obstacles is people don't think they need Jesus. Of course. And that's the danger. Most people don't realize they need Jesus till they get so far in trouble right. that there's no way out. And then they're looking for Jesus to help them. And I always have the sense that that Jesus probably responds, you know, where were you three months ago when this started? But now that you're here, that's the good thing about Jesus. Yeah. He will help. 
So I've got a couple of verses, Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, no one. And Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So just to admit you're a sinner and you need a Savior. So that's the A, admit. And then B is believe. Believe that Jesus Christ died, paying the penalty for your sins, and rose victoriously from the grave. I love 1 Corinthians 15. You know that verse, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So to believe, admit, believe. Any other thoughts? Because I haven't gotten to see yet. See is confess. Confess Jesus. Call on. Call on Jesus. Call on Jesus to save you and to trust him uh, for your salvation. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yep. And I've got a D also. You know, I determined. That's not the rules, Tom. I'm sorry. (laughs) You should pay attention to the rules. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. D is. I decide today to be a disciple of Jesus for the rest of my life. And uh, believe it or not... That's what we were just talking about. Yeah, I've been using that ABCD, and I keep trying to train people to do that because it is so simple. It's a good reminder. But if you have that, you know, and I tell people, look, you don't have to quote every scripture verse when you do that, but you have to tell the story and give people the opportunity. Well, this is one of these foundational understandings that we were talking about earlier as well, that we... We need to have a, a, a biblical understanding of God's simple plan of salvation. You can use the ABC model. You can use the Romans Road model. There are other, many materials out there to to prompt us to understand salvation so that we share salvation with others. Uh, the Romans Road, you, you use three verses all from Romans. So that ABC example that you just right. did is kind of a, a condensed version of the Romans Road that walks through several passages in Romans to paint this picture that all have sinned uh, and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. There's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the sins of the world, so that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that he is risen from the grave, you will be saved. There's salvation right there. And we could rattle off in the next five minutes 20 passages from the New Testament that says, what must you do to be saved? Mm -hmm. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Nicely done. We're going to take a little break. You're listening to Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk, and we will be right back. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. It is time for Guy Talk today, and we are uh, just got done before the break talking about salvation. And it was a kind of a simple ABCs. Everybody's familiar with it, but not everyone knows it. And I think it's important to have things like an ABC uh, in your head. So when you have a conversation and you feel a little bit panicked, you can rely on something that has already been organized for you. You know, everybody lives their life by some standard some plumb line, some measuring device to determine whether or not they're off kilter or they're on on target. You can't build a house or a deck without using some standard, some measurement that you can trust. Otherwise, you're not going to get what the picture looks like. So in order for people to even know that they are a sinner, it has to be compared against some standard. Absolutely. And there's a really neat story. Ravi Zacharias, and I know what happened to Ravi, but he still had great stories and great teachings and so on. Ravi Zacharias told this story once, and he was about to give a lecture at the Ohio State University. And before the lecture, they took him on a tour of a new building they had built. I think it was called the Wexner Center. And I think it was a modern art kind of building or whatever. But the uh, the, the person giving him the tour said, welcome 
to America's first postmodern building. And they mm-hmm. took this tour, and there was doors that opened up into walls and stairways that led to nowhere. <laughs> and otherwise, these kind of random, meaningless kind of, um, um, you know, design elements that were considered postmodern. And the argument was that there was no purpose uh, in the design, that it just was, you know, flowing. There was no standard, if you will, to uh, to guide them in, in the building of this building. Well, they get done with the tour, and they ask Ravi Zacharias, what, is, what do you think? And he says, I just have one question for you. Did you do the same thing with the foundation? Oh, that's a great question. Wow. wow. Do you see what he's saying? Yeah. yeah. You can play all the games you want, but you can't build a building without that plumb line, without that standard. They couldn't do that with the foundation because the building would fall down. It of would course. never stand. So there are certain things, and, and now let's translate this into faith, the faith journey of Christians, that we, when we build our lives on that standard, like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock, mm-hmm. the waves will come, the winds will come, but the house will still stand. That is the word of God. That is understanding God's precepts, his ways, his doctrine, that what did you say, the standard of the plumb line in which we build our life upon. That's right. That's right. Well, that goes back to the the conversation we had on, on the previous uh, segment about discipleship. What is the purpose of discipleship? Well, one is to introduce them to the plumb line. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which is God's word, God's standard, so that we can understand where we've deviated and why our life is the way that it is uh, because we chose something else to be the standard for our life. I know of a pastor who I would consider very creative. He wanted to teach the Roman road to his congregation. And he had tried it before, and nobody remembered it. You know, it didn't go over well. So he got one of the young men in the congregation, pretty big guy, and they went to a costume shop and got a Roman centurion outfit. So on Sunday, he brings the centurion out while he's talking about it, and he had broken down the Roman road into six parts, you know, call, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. So the Roman soldier shouted, you know, that's the call. And then he would explain it. Then he'd go, you know, but, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so he had, the Roman soldier picks up an awl, you know, like a wooden awl. Mm -hmm. It's visual. So anyway, they did that all the way through. And everybody thought he was a little goofy. But for the next two or three months, kids would come up to him every Sunday and say, I can give you the Roman road. And they could go through it step by step. Not Mm -hmm. perfect, but they could do it because what I think we do is we we intellectualize Christianity when, you know, you talk about a, a plumb line. Wouldn't it be something to see a plumb line come down on Sunday morning in a Sunday school class or from up there where the right. pulpit is to illustrate this? Because people won't forget what they see. You know, I can remember five years old. I can remember seeing my church at Christmas time. I can see the two Christmas trees. I can see the people up there. Can't tell you a word the pastor said. Hmm. But I can remember that, and so I think that might be a fun way to do it. Well, Christ's greatest teaching was by stories and parables that gave them pictures that they could compare their life to or they could you know, draw the conclusions or the principles that, that he was trying to teach. Yeah, often. I mean, think of Ephesians 6 and the the armor of God yeah. and the spiritual battle. Paul was described, He's this is one of his prison epistles, you know, most likely had a Roman soldier standing over him. He's trying to teach or write upon this spiritual battle that we are engaged in. And he starts describing that as believers, we are armed with the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit. And he goes on, he's using the exact techniques that this pastor used in order to describe these realities, these truths that, hey, Christian, you've been armed with God so that you can walk with confidence through these spiritual battles. In our culture today, we're visually cued. When I go to speak to groups of men, like when I do a, an advance or something, I always bring my sword and helmet with me. The sword is a replica of what Maximus and Gladiator stuck in the tree at the beginning of the movie, if you remember it. And so the first thing I do when I walk up on stage with that sword as I take it and I jam it into the platform. And I usually have a piece of wood there, so I don't go on the platform. <laughs> You're thankful. And you could hear a pin drop, and that sword is just kind of wavering as I start to talk about the importance wow. of the Word of God. And so at the end, they all want to come up and look at that sword. Mm-hmm. But they'll never forget the lesson that was associated with that sword. I, 
I have a broadsword, double-edged broadsword. It's, uh, you know, I don't know, four feet long maybe. And I bring it to my classes every once in a while as well. And so I hold it up. And we, when, we're, when I'm talking about learning the Word of God, understanding it, the doctrinal stuff, the discipleship that we've been talking about much today, and I'll ask somebody, ask somebody to come up and I'll hand them that sword and I'll ask them a question. Do you think you could defend yourself with this sword? Now, if you've ever held a two-handed broadsword, yeah. you know, most Heavy. people have trouble just holding it, let alone trying to wield it back and forth and defending themselves against an attacker, right? But in a skilled hand, the broadsword is a very effective weapon, and you can defend yourself uh, against enemies, right? Um, but it takes training. Yes. In the same way, God says that the Word of God is a sharp double-edged sword, but we need to be trained in its use to use it effectively. You know, I have a sharp double-edged sword, too, that I illustrate and use. Doesn't every pastor and teacher of the Word have one? I mean, you should have one of those, you know, the sharp double-edged sword that comes out of the Lord's mouth. Mm -hmm. It is a visual that people do not forget. Mm -hmm. I have a five-blade sword, and boy, does it shave closely. (laughs) (laughs) I have to say, I've got a real nice, clean shave You're looking good, Bill. Thank you so much, Tom Parrish. (laughs) All right, my next question is, the human heart hates anything that threatens our self-sovereignty. What's with that? Why do we want to be in charge? Why are we so determined to hate anything that threatens our self-sovereignty. We belong to the family of God. Jesus. That's, that's a battle even after you come to know Jesus because there is a part of us that's so broken that we, like Adam and Eve in the garden, we want to be God. We want to be in charge. We want to have the final say. And I think that m- most people in life have been hurt so much by others along the way that they want control. And I see a lot of people do that. The, pe- the, the women and men that I've helped come out of witchcraft, and that's quite a few people, they all went into it for control, mm. for power over mm. somebody else. So I think that what we have to do is make that transfer of power, that it's not my power that makes this happen. It's the Lord's power. But that is not an easy task, and it's something I've been working at for years with people. You know, people's susceptibility to wanting to live an independent life has as a precursor, I believe, low self-esteem. And when you have low self-esteem, you want to control anything around you or keep anything that can harm you from you. And you'll do whatever it takes to maintain that independence so that you're not influenced by anything else. Um, And so I think it's just a natural inclination of human nature to want to live life independently. And, you know, our history as a country really supports independence and living an independent life. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. I think it's we're taught it, we we view it, we value it, you know, self-reliance, self-dependence, uh, self-made man, that kind of thing. So we're taught that often. But there's also something innately inside of us. You, you said human nature. I think in the Greek in the New Testament, that's called the flesh or is often mm-hmm. translated as the flesh in the New Testament. And it's this uh, maybe a self-preservation, a, a desire for you know, wealth or power to for control over people. And I think there is a, some kind of innate human aspect to uh, that's common to man. And so I think it's both. I think it's both external and internal. Uh, that's why, by the way, when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ for the first time, one of the things he said was that he must increase, I must decrease. Paul said it later in Galatians, not my will, or Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. Paul said it this way, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. These are all expressions of saying, my, I'm going to put down my will, and I'm going to submit to God's will. And, you know, I use that as a way of defining spiritual growth. When I hear adults start to say to me, you know, I used to think I was pretty important, or I used to think that the kingdom of God needed me, or whatever language. I now realize it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And I'm only here a short period of time. To me, if I've ever heard somebody sound immature, it usually comes out in that way. They're growing up. I've got a couple more thoughts on that, but I think we'll take a break and be right back. You're listening to Guy Talker, Guys Who Talk... Hi there and welcome. If you are a new listener, we want to officially welcome you with a free welcome packet gift. 
Request yours today at MyFaithRadio.com. Welcome back to Guide Talk, or guys who talk the views, opinions, lame jokes made by the guests do not reflect <laughs> those of the show, the management, the network, or the host. I just I want you to know that. But most of the time, the host does agree with everything. All right, uh, gentlemen, I've got Greg B. Most Tom, of Jeff the time? B. Most of the time. Oh, no, yeah. like almost all the time. Does a all red right. light go off? No, when you're done, no, no, no. Okay, yeah. All right, we were talking about how uh, we don't want to have, we hate anything that threatens our self-sovereignty. And now I'm going to quote Shakespeare, which I don't do very often. And Shakespeare said, the wise man knows himself to be a fool. The fool thinks himself to be wise. Mm. And in Proverbs 19, verse 3, it says, a man's own foolish acts destroy his life, but his heart is angry with the Lord. How many times have you seen that where someone blows up their life and then they're mad at God? Yeah, exactly. A lot, unfortunately. It's very easy to go there. Mm -hmm. Projection. You've projected all your problems on the source of love. It's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a question. I listened to Guide Talk for a long time. Thank you for listening to Guide Talk for a long time. And I appreciate your emphasis on once saved, always saved. Unfortunately, many... And some estimate up to 80% of those who give their life to Jesus at an altar call or a rally, they fall away from the church and Christianity within a year. What can we do as the church to stop this? Yeah, once we catch the fish, we need to keep the fish, right? Exactly. Um, you, you know, catching the fish is this idea of, I come, I will make you fishers of men, so we need to proclaim the gospel and catch men for the kingdom, but... Um, the, we've had a theme today, kind of this discipleship theme. Once you catch the fish, you need to feed the fish, care for the fish, disciple the fish, teach the fish, train the fish. This is the uh, the metaphor in Scripture doesn't use fish actually for discipleship. It often uses sheep, however, for a metaphor for discipleship, that uh, the shepherds of the flock need to care for the sheep, feed the sheep. Uh, and the food that we feed Uh, in in discipling, feed the sheep, is always the Word of God. And so the food, what does a shepherd do? He feeds the flock and he protects the flock. And the metaphors in Scripture is when you feed the flock, you're feeding them the Word of God. And when you're protecting the flock, you're protecting them from those savage wolves. As Paul talks about in uh, Acts 20, I fear that when I leave you, savage wolves will sneak in amongst you and teach things that not ought to be taught. So what is a shepherd to do? What is the church to do? We are to feed the flock and for the word of God, the truth of the word of God, and protect them from the false teaching of the savage wolves. Underscores again the importance of discipleship oh. leading to Christ-likeness. Oftentimes I go to pastor's conferences, and just like you were talking, Craig, you know, I'll ask, well, how do you disciple people? What do you, what do? You do? And I cannot tell you how many pastors I've heard say, well, we have a feeding program, you know, at our church. Every Wednesday night we have a dinner for the community. I say, okay, what about the other 20 meals? You know, they'll just look at me like, what's wrong with you? (laughs) I think in Christianity we think that when somebody says Jesus is Lord or surrenders to him, well, they should be full. Instead of realizing they need a meal tomorrow. They need a meal the next day. And that's that meal of the fellowship, of the Word of God, of our presence with one another. You know, one of the reasons I've been doing the show so long is for a very simple reason. I get fed here. Mm-hmm. This, for me, is is the greatest feeding I get all week. And without this, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing now. And hopefully my congregation will say they wouldn't they wouldn't be benefiting like they are. So, yeah, it's our, but it's, this is important. It's our daily bread, right? It is. I mean, so we have to come back to our daily bread. Let's go back to the example, to the question. So what if someone says they believed but leaves? How do we deal with that doctrine of, within a once saved, always saved, or I like to describe it as assurance of salvation, that we can have true uh, personal assurance of our salvation? Well, I think the answer is is one of two things. Either they never believed, they just thought they did or mouthed the words and never really believed in their heart, right? And so they walked away, and so they were amongst us, but they were never one of us, and so they left us kind of thing. Or I actually believe they could have had a genuine experience, but they weren't being fed and they weren't growing, and they just walked away and returned to the world from which they came, which there's so many exhortations to not return to the world. 
Now, people ask me, have asked me all the time, and I'm sure you guys as well, well, what about my cousin so-and-so or my uncle so-and-so? They said they believed early on in life, and now they're far from God and doing whatever. Where are they at today? And I answer the same way. I can tell you the doctrine for, with certainty. I believe in assurance of salvation. I think that's biblical. But I cannot apply that to any individual because I can't see their heart. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like you, because I, I get this all the time, because I work with evangelicals across the spectrum. And there, believe it or not, there are a lot of Lutheran evangelicals. And I'm part of a big evangelism task force among Lutherans. The problem is when people ask that question, I've discovered is that because they don't know what to do, they want the assurance that everything's okay. Well, that's not the issue any longer. And I've even said to people, I don't think that's the question you need to be asking. The question you need to be asking is, what is the Lord telling you to do to get your cousin, your nephew, or whatever, back into the presence of the Lord and in the church? And too often we don't help people understand the process for doing that because, quite frankly, most churches don't know the process for doing that. Years ago when I was pursuing my MDiv at Bethel, um, I had a preaching prof, and we had to prepare a message, and we had to go ahead and and share that message with the class, and then he would evaluate it. And so I put one together I thought was hitting the ball out of the park. And when I was done, I had this big smile on my face, and Bill Hoyt was the professor at the time. And he says, Greg, that was a great sermon, but it was all oughtness without enablement. It was all what? Oughtness without enablement. What does that mean? It means that here's what you ought to do but we never tell them or enable them to be able to do it. So we're always declaring, you've got to do this. You've got to pray. You've got to read the Word of God. But we don't show them how to do it. So it's oughtness without enablement. Good word. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Otherwise, I thought, I don't know what oughtness means. I'm just too stupid to ask. <laughs> Well, you ought to have asked me. <laughs> I ought, yeah, and I'm glad I did. There's that lame joke I was talking about. Oh, boy. Okay, no, i got to be nice to We're Greg getting warm. Very up. specific reason today. All right. Um, <laughs> as I love, we're wrapping up our time here. We, we jumped into discipleship quite a bit today, which I've loved. But I think of the chronically ill woman uh, who probably almost was maybe superstitious. If I just touch his garment, I'll be, I'll be good. That's not relational. That's superstitious, isn't it? And Jesus took that. She had a physical healing, but turned her into a woman who became a disciple with a personal relationship that would last through all through all of eternity. Mm. There's a lot of people still with superstitions. They're out there. And, and the key that Jesus did, and the key that we need to do, is not mm. to immediately confront them with their superstitions, but how can we bring redemption into what they're saying, even though they don't understand it, and pull them to the Lord? She, He said, I felt the power go out of me. And she finally admitted that. So I'm always looking for ways to step into people's lives rather than shut people off. You know, there's a lot of people that were attracted to Jesus because he healed and he provided. He provided food, multiplied the loaves and the fishes, and healed many, many people. And so many people were coming after him for that healing. That's not why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He was looking for people that would worship God in spirit and in truth. He was looking for believers, people who would put their faith in him. So he attracted attention with his miracles of healing and feeding and walking on water and raising Lazarus from the dead and so on. But his real mission was to teach people that about God, about their sin, and that you could be saved, have everlasting life through faith in him. I think it would be a nice way to wrap up Hour 1 of Guy Talk with John one twelve that says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Hmm. Wow. Amen. Amen. So good. So good. So, gentlemen, I, I've really enjoyed this hour, and I love that we uh, sort of jumped into the discipleship end because we all need to be trained and equipped and become more mature believers and devoted followers of Christ. Mm-hmm. So thank you for that. We're going to take mm-hmm. a uh, break, and then we'll be back with Hour 2 of Guy Talk. And uh, there's still a lot more to discuss, and we are always uh, anxious to get your questions. If we don't get to them today, we will get to them, because I store them in a folder called Great Guy Talk Questions, and every <laughs> question that comes in is great. So you can send those over anytime to 877 933 2484 again 
888-242-2484. And if your mind has a hard time remembering numbers, my email address is bill at myfaithradio.com. Bill at myfaithradio.com. We'll be right back with Hour 2 of God Talk. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.